misdeeds made him a legend. But the vainglorious mariner would discover that the price of infamy was costly indeed. The city of Bristol lies on England's pastoral southwest coast. It was there, under misty southern skies, that Edward Teach, the future pirate Blackbeard, was born. As a child, Teach and his schoolmates played upon the waterfront docks, listening to sailors' tales of mysterious and exotic lands that lay across the Atlantic, far from the bustling working-class port of Bristol. You had a place in which all cultures were brought together. So it would be a time that a young man, erstwhile, probably not rich, trying to find a way out of the morass, out of poverty, uh, the, the way to go was to sea. At times of war, there wasn't a problem because the Royal Navy was able to take on a lot of men. And there were also privateers that the men could go to sea on, which was pretty much legal piracy. Edward Teach's seafaring career began during Queen Anne's War as a privateer, plundering enemy ships in the service of the Crown. When the war ended in 1713, he was among the thousands of mariners who found themselves stranded in the West Indies without jobs. There was always the merchant navy, but to free spirits like Teach, its prospect of low wages and harsh discipline were hardly appealing. Instead, Teach and others of his ilk chose the darker side of the law, and thus began the golden age of piracy. A lot of these guys were, were leaving strict environments, harsh environments, for the life of a pirate, where you essentially were your own government, uh, you were under no man's control, you could go and do what you pleased. A pirate knew when he went to sea that his days were probably numbered, and it was a chance that he took. Their flag quite often contained the hourglass, which meant that their duration was probably going to be short. A short life and a merry one. Once he made the decision to become a pirate or go upon the account, Teach set out for the lush islands of the Bahamas. Located near the European shipping lanes, these tropical ports made ideal hideouts for the pirates known as the Brethren of the Coast. The seedy town of Nassau, located on the island of New Providence, was world-renowned as a teeming pirate's nest. It seems to have been a sort of shanty town, really, with tents made of sailcloth and palm leaves, and a sort of rather rackety group of, of pirates and prostitutes and seamen and merchants um, having a good time, really. It was in this den of sea robbers and scallywags that the unemployed Edward Teach met a man who would forever change his life. Captain Benjamin Hornigold. Hornigold, another privateer turned pirate, had a reputation as the most able freebooter on the island. Benjamin Hornigold took Edward Teach under his wing and they went on the account together. And Hornigold was very impressed with Teach because he showed a tremendous amount of courage and ferocity in fighting, and he was also very clever and a quick student to learn. The elder pirate instilled in Teach a principle that would serve him well. A fearsome reputation was far more effective than the brutal tactics employed by some of their more vicious counterparts. Hornigold wasted little time in promoting Teach from protégé to partner, and the devilish duo proved fierce as any that ever put to sea. Operating out of Nassau Harbor, they plundered and captured ships from all over the world. In 
In 1717, they sailed north to colonial America, where they preyed upon merchant ships along the capes of Virginia and Delaware. Teach and Hornigold's northern passage proved wonderfully lucrative, as the pirates pillaged unchecked, terrorizing the shipping lanes of the Atlantic. Then, heading south on their return to the Bahamas, they encountered their richest prize yet. She was the proud French merchantman Concorde, on her way from Nantes to Martinique. Teach and Hornigold were lurking in the waters of St. Vincent when they spied her brilliant white sails flapping in the breeze. The two pirate ships raised the black flag and quickly gave chase. Before the French vessel could maneuver into a defensive position, both ships were upon her. In unison, they fired broadsides, killing half the merchantman's crew. Their attack was so swift that the Concorde did not have time to maneuver and surrendered immediately. Hornigold was delighted by their cash. The ship was loaded with gold dust, money, plate and jewels. Teach was more taken by the sturdy and swift Dutch-built Concorde herself and asked Hornigold if he might claim her as a prize. From that captured merchantman, Teach would launch some of his most daring and nefarious deeds. Shortly after the capture of the Concorde, Hornigold and Teach parted ways. Hornigold had decided that he wanted to take the King's pardon. Whether he was getting too old for the life or he just thought, you know, there was a problem on the horizon and he didn't want to be to hang as a pirate or, or what. But Blackbeard certainly was just beginning his career as a pirate and Hornigold's career was ending, so they, they parted naturally. Now on his own, Teach set about converting the Concorde into a true pirate ship. Taking on a crew of 300 men, Teach christened her the Queen Anne's Revenge. The Queen Anne's Revenge was known to be carrying 40 guns, a major platform of destruction. Blackbeard went about his own way on the Queen Anne's Revenge and was certainly operating in and around that Eastern Caribbean area. In 1718, piracy wasn't solely confined to the waters of the Caribbean. There were thousands of pirates plundering vessels in nearly every ocean on the globe, some more brazen and violent than others. Contrary to myth, Teach was not the most murderous, but he did possess a tacit understanding of psychological warfare and a flair for the dramatic. To enhance his already fearsome reputation, he let a coarse black beard grow until it covered his entire face. Braiding the unruly mane with ribbons, he renamed himself Blackbeard. Captain Charles Johnson, a contemporary of the bearded mariner, gave an accounting of the pirate's new identity in his landmark 18th century work, A General History of the Pirates. That large quantity of hair, which like a frightful meteor covered his whole face, and frightened America more than any comet that has appeared there a long time. Captain Johnson's astronomic metaphor proved uncannily fitting. For in the coming 13 months, Blackbeard would soar to heights of piracy never before imagined, and like a comet streaking across a blackened sky, would leave a fiery legacy in his wake. Now on his own, Blackbeard was eager to step out from under his mentor Benjamin Hornigold's illustrious shadow. According to legend, he began his reign of terror in an audacious fashion, engaging in a running battle with the Royal Naval ship, the Scarborough. One of Blackbeard's great exploits was he had fought the Royal Navy and had beaten the Royal Navy. That gave him a reputation of somewhat higher skills and admiration amongst the other pirates. It was unusual. Word of Blackbeard's clash with the HMS Scarborough spread quickly, striking fear in the hearts of merchant captains and earning the instant respect of other brethren of the coast. The brazen outlaw watched with glee as the wicked reputation he had so carefully cultivated grew until whispers of the black-faced devil 
echoed below the decks of every ship at sea. They even found their way into the reports of Captain Charles Johnson. In time of action, he wore a sling over his shoulders with three brace of pistols hanging in holsters like bandoliers, and stuck lighted matches under his hat, which appearing on each side of his face, his eyes naturally looking fierce and wild, made him altogether such a figure that imagination cannot form an idea of a fury from hell to look more frightful. Blackbeard, who was clearly an intelligent and formidable character, realized that the more ferocious he appeared, the easier it would be to make his attacks. Remember, when ships encountered each other, they hadn't seen other humans for a long time, so they'd stop and they'd talk. It was like chatting over the back fence, and rumors would spread very quickly that way. And something as bizarre as a, uh, a mad captain with whose beard was aflame, uh, that would be a story that'd be told pretty quickly. Most crews surrendered merely at the sight of such a monster. Sailors of that era were highly superstitious, and many believed Blackbeard to be the very devil himself. When you were an innocent sailor really trying to get home um, uh, to your family, and you looked up and you saw a ship uh, led by a madman, and manned by screaming um, uh, uh, madmen, uh, you, you gave up real quick. Despite his demonic appearance, Blackbeard never murdered or maimed his victims so long as they acquiesced to his demands. But woe be unto those who resisted, for the consequences were swift and severe. There seems to be sort of a sort of unwritten law among the pirates that if you attacked a ship and the crew surrendered instantly, you did not take revenge on the crew. You simply, you know, let them go loose. But if the crew of a merchant ship put up a fight, then the likelihood was that the pirates would fight them to the death and cut their throats and throw them overboard, simply as an example, really. Occasionally, Blackbeard turned his wrath upon his own men. One infamous evening, he was drinking in his cabin with his trusted Lieutenant Israel Hands and another crew member. With a pistol in each hand, Blackbeard crossed his arms under the table. And he hit Israel Hands directly in the knee. And when asked why he did this thing, his response was that if he did not kill one of them now and again, they would forget who he was. While his tactics could be ruthless, the crusty buccaneer did have an Achilles heel, the fairer sex. Prostitutes and women of ill repute were plentiful in every port. Blackbeard, alleged to have taken 14 wives, preferred a more romantic alternative to prostitutes. After a weekend of drinking and courtship, the sentimental pirate would take his love interest aboard the Queen Anne's Revenge, and a crew member would perform a convincing but phony marriage ceremony. The marriage, born of an excess of rum and lust, would last until Blackbeard shipped out for his next great adventure. Though abandoned, his erstwhile lover could boast that she had bedded and wedded the most feared man to sail the seven seas. Despite his romantic dallyings, Blackbeard's ultimate passion was the quest for notoriety and prizes. In December of 1717, now two months into his reign of terror, Blackbeard and his crew were prowling the Azure Caribbean waters off the tiny coast of Crab Island when they happened upon the merchant ship Margaret. Blackbeard's large crew descended upon the hapless vessel, plundering everything of value. She was then permitted to return to her home port, where her captain filed a written deposition of the ransacking with the Lieutenant Governor. This deponent says the captain was a tall, spare man with a very black beard, which he wore very long. This deponent further says that he told them an act of grace was expected out for them, but they seemed to slight it. The Margaret was one of a score of vessels terrorized and plundered by Blackbeard in late 1717. On one of his raids, Blackbeard crossed paths with gentleman planter turned pirate Steed Bonnet. 
Blackbeard quickly realized that while Bonnet wasn't much of a pirate, his sloop Revenge and sizable crew would be of great value in future escapades. The two captains joined forces, and Blackbeard soon put one of his own men in charge of Bonnet's ten-gun vessel. Now, with three ships and over 300 men under his command, Blackbeard faced the daunting task of keeping this flotilla of irascible cutthroats under control, especially when the liquor ran low. Such a day, rum all out. A company somewhat sober. A damn confusion amongst us. Rogues are plotting. Great talk of separation. So I look sharp for a prize. Such a day took one with a great deal of liquor on board, so kept the company hot, damned hot. Then all things went well again. Blackbeard was a shrewd and charismatic Commodore, possessing an uncanny ability to read the mood of his monstrous crew. At the first hint of unrest, he set about restoring order and confidence. The qualities that served Blackbeard as a pirate commander were certainly no different from those that serve any natural leader of men today, uh, particularly in a military situation. And like all pirate captains, Blackbeard, um, I think, led by example. I, I, he was a good navigator. Uh, he, he, he was lucky. He found prizes. Uh, he was courageous. And the men liked that because it increased their chances of, of wealth. Fortune had looked kindly upon the roguish captain and his crew. They were enjoying the freedom, adventure, and wealth they dreamt of as young boys. Content with their successes on the crystal blue waters of the Caribbean, Blackbeard and his men disappeared from the busy shipping lanes, taking a much needed respite. The early part of 1718, January, February, March, there's like a hole and, and the information that we know on Blackbeard. We have no idea what he was doing, where he was. Blackbeard's disappearance was a relief to merchant sailors. Little did they know, in his hiatus from high seas pillaging, Blackbeard was planning an act so bold and horrific that it would bring the proud city of Charleston, South Carolina, and her citizens to the brink of destruction. After disappearing from the shipping lanes for three months, Blackbeard resumed his reign of terror. He re-emerged in April of 1718, taking prizes in the Western Caribbean and bolstering his impressive armada. The scourge of the Seven Seas was back with a vengeance. On a breezy April afternoon, Blackbeard's pirate fleet attacked a heavily armed merchant ship out of Boston, the Protestant Caesar, captained by William Wire. Blackbeard fought the ship and was actually fought off, which was unusual for Blackbeard. Normally, he, you know, carried all before him. Damn their eyes! Blackbeard fumed over this grand humiliation as he watched the Protestant Caesar sail safely away. Fearful that word of his defeat would reach other merchant ships, the pirates stalked Captain Wire's vessel, finally cornering her in the Bay of Honduras. Despite their earlier victory, the captain and crew of the Protestant Caesar were mortified by the sight of Blackbeard's flotilla entering the bay. Choosing not to tempt fate a second time, they abandoned ship. Blackbeard sends word ashore, since your men uh, surrendered and didn't put up a fight, I forgive you. I'm going to burn your ship, however, but it's just as well you didn't put up a fight, because if you had, and I couldn't guarantee the consequences, meaning that he'd have presumably cut their throat. Once again, the legendary marauder's reputation had preceded him, providing another easy victory. Emboldened by his conquest of the Protestant Caesar, Blackbeard set about plotting the most brazen act of terrorism ever waged upon a colonial port, the blockade of Charleston, South Carolina. Blackbeard sailed up to the port, the entrance to the port of Charleston in May of 1718, 
capture the pilot boat and then proceeded to capture most every vessel that was coming in and out. He had Charleston at his beck and call. One of the first prizes Blackbeard captured in the harbor was the Crowley, a merchant ship bound for London carrying several of Charleston's wealthiest and most influential citizens. Swearing death upon any soul caught in a lie, Blackbeard interrogated the crew and passengers as to their cargo and destination. When the Inquisition was complete, he hurled them into the dank cargo hold of the Crowley, where they cowered in terror. Remember, there was the undercurrent of violence. And so you got drunken men armed to the teeth, um, breaking out into fights, and all that, you know, the people, people who were captured by them just felt completely demoralized and terrified the whole time because they felt that, you know, that they could go off the rails and have their throats cut and be chucked overboard at any moment. While his hostages awaited their fate, Blackbeard leafed through the Crowley's papers and, to his delight, discovered that he held in his possession an invaluable bargaining chip. He had one of the leading citizens and a member of the South Carolina Council, Samuel Ragg, as a hostage that had been captured on one of the vessels and could have demanded anything. With Charleston at his mercy, Blackbeard could have commanded any of the city's treasures, yet his sole request was a puzzling one. In exchange for the lives of the hostages, Blackbeard demanded a paltry 300 pounds worth of medicines. Some say the romantic rogue was seeking treatment for a social disease, a wedding gift perhaps from one of his more recent brides. He sent in two or three of his pirates uh, along with a Mr. Marks uh, to demand this uh, chest of medicine from the governor. Two days passed without word from the governor. For the captives locked beneath the decks of the Crowley, time crept slowly by. During this time, Blackbeard was just getting more and more angry and threatened to send in the heads of the hostages and to indeed come into the port and essentially raise the, raise the town. Blackbeard summoned hostage Samuel Ragg to the deck of the Queen Anne's Revenge. Remarkably, Ragg convinced him to stay the executions a few more days. Two more days came and went, and Blackbeard's patience was nearly exhausted. He exploded with a tirade of curses and threats, bellowing that he would burn every ship in Charleston. This time, he would not be dissuaded. Blackbeard ordered his fleet into battle positions inside the harbor. The pirate ships anchored just offshore and trained their many cannons on the city. Captain Charles Johnson wrote of the fear that seized Charleston on that horrible day. Being in all eight sail of ships, which were the prizes they had in custody and ranged along the town, the inhabitants then had their share of fright, expecting nothing less than a general attack. The men were brought all under arms. The women and children ran about the street like mad things. Blackbeard paced the deck in a rage, prepared to give the order to fire. Suddenly, he caught sight of his men and their hostage, medicine in tow, hurriedly rowing towards the Queen Anne's revenge. Their return from the governor had been delayed by an overturned boat, followed by a drunken tour of Charleston's many pubs. On the deck of the Queen Anne's Revenge, pirates and prisoners alike held their breaths as the longboat rolled toward the ship. Blackbeard's fury was unabated, and the cannoneers awaited his command. After an interminable wait, he ordered his men to stand down. Charleston was spared. Blackbeard's blockade of Charleston was his most outrageous act. He literally brought the Carolina government to its knees. I think it was, in a way, the attack on Charleston that uh, 
prompted the authorities, and in particular, of course, um, Alexander Spotswood, Governor of Virginia, to say, look, we've really got to do something about this chap. The pernicious Governor Spotswood and other colonial governors were tiring of the devastation wrought by pirates off their shores. Pirate trials and executions were becoming commonplace in Virginia and South Carolina. Blackbeard decided to set sail for a place where men of his ilk were welcomed and respected. North Carolina. North Carolina, under pirate-friendly Governor Charles Eden, still retained a frontier attitude that suited both gentlemen and scoundrel alike, and King's pardons were easily obtained. Before seeking a pardon, Blackbeard secretly decided to make some changes in his enormous crew. I think he started crunching some numbers, and I think at this time he began to devise the plan of breaking up his company and downsizing. Blackbeard had hatched a plan. He wanted to get rid of some of the crew because that way there would be more for him, more booty for himself and his closest companions. Announcing to his crew that it was time to clean their ship's hulls, Blackbeard sailed into Topsail Inlet and grounded the Queen Anne's Revenge and the sloop Adventure. He then sent Steed Bonnet and most of his men ashore under the pretense of obtaining the King's pardons. That was treachery. That's what that was all geared for, to get rid of Bonnet. And Blackbeard took everything off Bonnet's ship, the Revenge, provisions, all the booty that was on it, and made away. When Bonnet returned and discovered his shipmate's treachery, he went back to piracy until he was later captured and hanged in South Carolina. Meanwhile, with the adventure laden with his ill-gotten loot, Blackbeard and his pared-down crew sailed northward for Bath on the Pamlico River, where they did indeed receive pardons from Governor Charles Eden. There, Amongst the elegant plantation mansions of the quiet seaside town, Blackbeard attempted to put down roots for the first time in his boisterous life. He took his first legitimate bride, a 16-year-old planter's daughter, and adopted the mannerisms of a true southern gentleman. In the town's social circles, he soon became a local celebrity. He was sort of the talk of the town. Everyone wanted to talk to him and hear of his adventures. He had wonderful stories to tell, and he was very boisterous and a braggart. Blackbeard's time in North Carolina wasn't confined to elegant balls and dinner parties. He established headquarters among the swampy inlets and secluded channels of Ocracoke Island, where he dabbled in small-scale smuggling. We think that he essentially chose Ocracoke because things were getting hot elsewhere. Blackbeard appeared oblivious to his precarious position. He was firmly nestled between the vindictive governors of South Carolina and Virginia. They were consumed with a hatred for pirates that wouldn't abate until Blackbeard was dead. The noose he had so long avoided was beginning to tighten. August 1718. Summers in Bath, North Carolina were tranquil for a retired pirate, but Blackbeard was growing restless. Just a few miles away lay the shipping lanes of the Atlantic. There, merchant vessels sailed to exotic ports of call, bearing untold riches and tempting the restless corsair every time he heard the distant cry of a seabird. He had experienced piracy and uh, the ease that it was to become wealthy, capture vessels. It was somewhat like a drug, if you will. I think he had, he had become addicted to it because it, it wasn't easy, essentially an easy way of life. Blackbeard grew weary of his placid surroundings and the call of the ocean proved too much. In the early fall of 1718, he and his men boarded Adventure, pardons in hand, and set sail for the northern colonies to meet up with freebooting friends from New Providence. We think that Blackbeard went into 
the Delaware Bay and up into Philadelphia because we know that uh, Governor Keith of Pennsylvania issued a warrant for Blackbeard's arrest shortly thereafter. The net was closing on Blackbeard and the Brethren of the Coast. 48 pirates, including Steed Bonnet, were hanged in South Carolina, and Blackbeard's former mentor, Benjamin Hornigold, had turned pirate hunter in the Bahamas. Upon fleeing Philadelphia, just ahead of the authorities, Blackbeard set sail for Bermuda, where he had successfully pillaged and plundered earlier in his reign of terror. En route to Bermuda, fate collided with temptation when Blackbeard encountered two French merchant ships sailing out of Martinique. One of the vessels was traveling in ballast, essentially had nothing on board. The other vessel, however, had a cargo of sugar and cocoa and some other goods and commodities. Blackbeard took the crew from the sugar ship, placed them on the empty ship, and sent it on its way. The cunning freebooter took his prize back to Ocracoke and reported to Governor Eden that he had found the French ship at sea without a soul on board her. Eden adjudged the ship a derelict and conveniently shared in the spoils with the pirates. Blackbeard then set fire to the sugar ship, sinking her in the Pamlico River, destroying all evidence of his brief return to piracy. Or so he thought. However, Spotswood up in Virginia did know about uh, the sugar ship and her capture. And because Blackbeard had claimed the king's pardon himself, the capture of the sugar ship essentially erased that pardon. For nearly 11 months, the furtive governor Spotswood had been monitoring the activities of Blackbeard. Obsessed with hatred for the bearded buccaneer, Spotswood spent more time railing against piracy than he did tending to his colony's affairs. Alexander Spotswood, in my opinion, was an autocratic, egotistical, dirty dealing character. At the time, Spotswood's own men wanted to get rid of him. Eight out of 12 in his own council, and also the House of Burgesses wanted him out. With his political fortunes on the wane, Spotswood desperately searched for a way to save his crumbling governorship. A solution presented itself in September of 1718 in the form of a rum-soaked pirate party hosted by Blackbeard on Ocracoke Island. While Blackbeard was anchored at Ocracoke, another ship approached, and it turned out to be the notorious pirate Charles Vane. They were old friends and knew each other from their days down in New Providence. So Vane came on shore and they had a wonderful party. It was pirates lolling around on the shore, presumably getting completely drunk and having a good time. They made a big thing of drinking. I mean, every time they, they had a toast, they would fire the ship's guns. Uh, just to make a big noise of it. The festivities roared on for days and became a who's who of infamy, including such pirates as Israel Hands and Calico Jack Rackham. News of the frolicking buccaneers soon found its way to Virginia's Governor Spotswood in the form of an outrageous rumor. Panicked fishermen reported that Blackbeard was turning Ocracoke into a pirate fortress, much like New Providence or Madagascar. As word spread, the colonists became quite frightened, and this gave Spotswood, the governor of Virginia, fuel to go after Blackbeard. Spotswood's cause was greatly aided by the capture of Blackbeard's former quartermaster who informed the governor as to the pirate's exact whereabouts and the number of men in his crew. With this newfound intelligence, the corrupt governor hatched a covert, albeit illegal, plan. He enlisted the aid of Governor Eden's political enemies, as well as that of the Royal Navy, including Lieutenant Robert Maynard. Maynard held the dubious distinction of being the oldest lieutenant in the Royal Navy and was anxious to make a name for himself. As an added incentive, 
Spotswood offered a reward to Blackbeard's captor. The several rewards following. That is to say, for Edward Teach, commonly called Captain Teach or Blackbeard, 100 pounds. Maynard and his complement of 58 men arrived at Ocracook Inlet on November the 21st. They arrive at the area at dusk and decide they wait till dawn the next day and Blackbeard is having a good time with some of his mates and boozing away. Blackbeard only had a few hands on board, certainly less than 20. We do have some evidence that he knew that there was something happening, that there was uh, an expedition in the works. Blackbeard doesn't appear to have cared one way or the other. Legend has it that at some time during the evening, Blackbeard discovered the Royal Naval sloops moored off Oak Oak Inlet. With fewer than 20 men under his command, he would have been wise to escape. Logic, however, fell victim to pride and arrogance as Blackbeard stood on the deck of the adventure and prayed for the cock to crow, signaling the dawn when the battle could get underway. Crow, cock crow. He was certainly bold, daring, willing to take chances. You could say that um, as he, he, he sort of believed in his own legend. Outmanned and outgunned, Blackbeard, the king of the golden age of piracy, awaited battle and an uncertain destiny. As dawn broke over the hazy North Carolina coast, the Royal Naval Sloops under the command of Lieutenant Robert Maynard weighed anchor and quietly made for the tip of Ukrukuk Inlet. In the distance, Maynard could see the masts of Blackbeard's sloop peeking over the sand dunes. Sailors in rowboats preceded the sloops, taking soundings in the treacherous shoals. When the rowboats ventured within range of the adventure, the stillness of the morning quickly turned to bedlam. Blackbeard's men unleashed several rounds of gunfire. The Battle of Ocracoke was on. The two sloops headed for the adventure, and Maynard's men fired with small arms without doing any real damage. Lieutenant Maynard's force outnumbered the pirates by more than two to one. But in the surly sea dog's mind, retreat was never an option. Blackbeard and what was left of his once feared crew were determined to fight to the death. He cut his anchor cable and steered the adventure directly toward the beach at Ocracoke Island in the hopes that the sloops would follow and become grounded on a sandbar. Even as Blackbeard maneuvered adventure, he engaged in a spirited exchange with Maynard. For the first time in his storied career, the old pirate had met his match in both courage and arrogance. Blackbeard took up a goblet of rum and toasted the Royal Navy's sloops. Damnation seize my soul if I give you quarter, or take any from you! I expect no quarter from you, nor shall I give any! There's this famous exchange when uh, Maynard shouts at Blackbeard to surrender, and Blackbeard says, well, you know, sod the lot of you, I'm blowed if I'm going to surrender, in so many 18th century words, and, um, and then fires his guns at the attacking sloops. The two naval sloops were in close pursuit as the adventure entered the shallows of the inlet. Their hulls grounded upon a hidden sandbar, exactly as the pirates had planned. Give him a broadside! Then Blackbeard ordered his cannons trained upon his now helpless enemies. Fire! With a thunder-like roar, the broadsides found their mark, killing the midshipmen of the second sloop and cutting Maynard's attacking force in half. But the recoil of the cannon had driven the adventure onto the shore. Now she, too, was stranded. Enveloped in smoke from the cannon blasts, Maynard managed to free his sloop with the aid of a breeze, and it floated toward the adventure. 
he hoped to lure the pirates aboard the deck of his own ship. To ensure this advantage, he resorted to trickery. Maynard keeps going, orders his men down below deck so Blackbeard doesn't see how many people he's got, comes up alongside, and um, Blackbeard thinks he's killed all, all the people on Maynard's ship, and so uh, immediately, you know, boards the ship. They're all knocked on the head but three or four. Lost you, board her and cut them to pieces! Then Maynard orders his men to come up, and an amazing battle takes place. Blackbeard, being the captain he was, and the leader of men, rallied his men, and the fight was one of the bloodiest battles that ever took place on the deck of a ship. The deck of the sloop was slick with the blood of the dead and wounded, but Blackbeard pressed the fight, swinging his cutlass with abandon, slashing and maiming all who stood in his way. Finally, he was face to face with Maynard. Both men drew and fired pistols, Blackbeard missed his mark, but Maynard's shot struck the enraged pirate in the body. Still Blackbeard fought on, cleaving Maynard's sword in two with a single bow of his cutlass. His nemesis now defenceless, Blackbeard moved in for the kill. I don't think Maynard would have stood much of a chance were it not for the fact that uh, a Highlander comes up behind Blackbeard and at the last moment takes a huge swipe at him and actually cuts his head off so it flops down on his, on his um, shoulder and Blackbeard drops to the deck. The chaos gave way to an eerie silence as the men began to realize what had taken place. The mighty Blackbeard was dead. It was an end of that courageous brute who might have passed in the world for a hero had he been employed in a good cause. Once the rest of the pirate crew had been captured or killed, Lieutenant Maynard examined Blackbeard's lifeless body. It's discovered that he's got, I don't know, five musket shots in him and 25 cutlass wounds. Maynard cut off his head, which wasn't just an act of bravado. The point about cutting off the head was, um, in a way, was traditional proof that here is the head of Blackbeard, I now demand my reward. With his macabre trophy dangling from his ship's bowsprit, Maynard had Blackbeard's tattered body thrown overboard, where, according to legend, it defiantly swam around the sloop several times before disappearing into the murky waters of Ocracoke. And so ended Blackbeard's brief but brilliant reign of terror. His notorious reputation made him the crown prince of the Brethren of the Coast. But in the end, his lust for glory and taste for wicked adventure proved to be his downfall. Throughout the years, the golden age of piracy has been greatly romanticized with its tales of buried treasure and swashbuckling villains. In reality, pirates' lives were bloody and uncertain. All who chose to sail under the black flag knew that the next white-capped wave might come bearing their fortune or their demise. <laughs>